Uh, I normally spend an hour giving a presentation on this stuff, and I've written whole books on it. Uh, but uh, in order to get in a 15-minute slot, we'll um, see uh, if I can race through it. So forgive me for the speed of things. One of the characteristics that marked a natural place or topographic feature as being sacred to ancient eyes was if its shape presented a likeness to some other form. A human face, a figure, an animal, a uh, symbolic shape meaningful to the perceiver. The dramatist Strindberg, for example, saw heads as if sculpted out of marble in the creases of bedclothes. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci instructed his apprentices to study the exquisite landscapes formed by the mold stains on his studio walls. I don't know how apocryphal that account is, but you never know. And ancient eyes saw it in the topography, in the actual landscape. Now here's a word we're getting used to. Thank you, Toro, for a full explanation of this. The human mind is geared to seek patterns, even in randomness, and the neuropsychological process involved in such perception is called pareidolia. A couple of uh, quotes there referring to this mode of vision, one by Antonin Arto, other by William Blake. Today, uh, we treat such observations as mere curiosities, but the willingness to culturally engage in such double vision, enabled an ancient society to see its mythology emblazoned on the landscape, to see its deities, culture heroes, or some religious symbolic icon in the very lie of the land. It mythologized a country, giving it meaning. The Australian Aboriginal perception of topography as being formed by dreamtime beings is a classic example and nowadays probably the best known. The scale of simulacra recognized by this dreamtime mode of perception can range from a small boulder to a rock outcrop or to a whole hillside or mountain range. So in the next few minutes available, I'll uh, whip through a few examples. It's all simple. I am a simple man. First of all, some anthropomorphic and zoomorphic examples. Rounded peaks located near Killarney on the west coast of Ireland are known as the Paps of Anu. They rise prominently due to their relative isolation and symmetry and roundness. In Gaelic, Paps means breasts. In myth, Anu was the mother of the last generation of gods who rule the earth. A similar type of simulacrum on the Scottish island of Jura allows us a direct glimpse into the Neolithic mind, as we shall now see. They're the paps of Jura. Oops. How do I go back? Uh, on the west coast of Scotland is the Mull of Kintyre, and on it stands three standing stones known as Balacroy. Now, the center stone has a perfectly flat surface, and it aligns directly uh, to the paps. And it, it, points, and it points to them where the sun, midsummer sun sets behind the paps of Jura. Now, Presumably, it means that these Neolithic people saw something like an earth goddess or whatever in those paps. This is not an entirely uh, wild speculation because on the Isle of Jura, almost touching, uh, sorry, the Isle of Isla, almost touching uh, Jura, uh, there is the Loch Finlagen, and around it are all sorts of Neolithic and Mesolithic remains. Now, there's this standing stone that still survives there. It's a very large stone. And 
archaeological investigation has shown that there was a, a row of stones leading up to it. They've gone, they're not visible now except by geophysical means. Uh, and that line of sight points straight to the Paps on Jura, uh, and they're very isolated, very uh, clear to see. So we are looking actually clearly at something that was important in Neolithic eyes, and those hills were it. This is a holy hill in Wales, uh, Carningley, Hill of Angels, and it's um, a, a sixth century anchorite used to go up there to see visions of angels. It's also uh, highly magnetic, uh, and there's all sorts of unusual phenomena occur around it. This naturally weathered granite outcrop on top of Carn Bray Hill in Cornwall is known as the Carn Bray Giant, and an early Neolithic settlement uh, was located next to it, adjacent to it. A legend is attached to the rock that is worthy of any Aboriginal Dreamtime story. Far away in Manitoba, uh, the Ashinanabe Indians continue to make offerings at Buffalo Rock, uh, a Buffalo at Rest, a boulder presenting that coincidental likeness. It's a very important area, this, but we haven't got time to go into it. And I've seen the Indians making offerings at it. A curious simulacrum obtrudes from one of the tall, weirdly weathered fingers of sandstone in the Teutoburger world in Germany. It's a rocky configuration that looks like a human figure with its arms outstretched, as if tied to the rock, as you can see. This natural feature has long been the source of speculation, including suggestions that it was seen as being a naturally occurring simulacrum of the pagan North European god Odin, hanging on the Norse version of the primordial world tree, Yggdrasil. Other people, other commentators, have argued that the feature was seen as Christ on the cross and it was Christianized by the addition of an artificial hole uh, representing the spear wound made in Christ's side as he hung on the cross. If this is correct, then it means it was a, uh, the only known case, as far as I know anyway, of the Christianization of a simulacrum. This whole area is very, very rich in simulacra all around the Externsteiner. Situated in Deir el Bahari in the Valley of the Kings, opposite Luxor, is the vast New Kingdom temple of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut. This happens to be positioned at the foot of a rock column which obtrudes from a cliff face behind it. No one saw anything special about this cliff face until 1991 when Egyptologist V.A. Donahue suddenly perceived that the forms within the rock column, quote, simulate the configuration of a statue group in which the cobra, its eyes and the lateral markings on the underside of its distended hood clearly observable, rears to the full height of the cliffs behind a standing anthropomorphic figure either sovereign or deity, who wears the headdress and beard of a pharaoh." End of quote. This rock configuration is badly eroded, but still discernible. It's worth noting that Hatshepsut was distinguished for her landscaping skills, and that the main axis of Karnak Temple aligns from across the Nile towards her temple. Interestingly, a figurine was unearthed at Karnak that perfectly resembles the grouping of a pharaoh with the cobra rearing up behind. Donahue has gone on to note that several pre-dynastic temples in Egypt have been located where cliff face simulacra of various kinds can be identified. Now a couple of examples of iconographic simulacra. 
quite startling example of an iconic simulacrum is to be found inside the Mayan ritual cave of Balancanche in the Yucatan, Mexico, near the ancient ceremonial city of Chichen Itza. In the central cavern, there is a giant fused stalactite stalagmite looking remarkably like a tree trunk with the impression of foliage created by countless small spiky stalactites. This calcite tree is surrounded by stone and wooden figures, pottery and sense burners, small pots and other votive objects. Carbon dating of cho charcoal from a censer and a harp suggests a 9th century date for the placing of these objects. The whole cave was sealed up, as it happens, by a rockfall and was only opened fairly recently. This striking tree-like formation was therefore clearly worshipped by the ancient Maya, who doubtless would have seen it as a representation of the Mayan world tree concept, Wakachan, raised up sky. The American art historian Vincent Scully put forward the idea that cleft or saddle peak mountain summits were originally seen as representing a landscape goddess. He wrote, quote, these features create a profile which is basically that of a pair of horns, but it may sometimes also suggest raised arms or wings, the female cleft, or even at some sites, a pair of breasts, end of quote. The Bronze Age uh, Minoans of Crete indeed had an iconic relationship with cleft peak mountains. Uh, which had been venerated even before the Minoans arrived. Their temple, <coughs> palace temples aligned to, or stand in sight of, such distinctive peaks, and they built shrines on their summits, as here at Knossos. Uh, I won't tell you what it took to get these photographs up on the top there, but there's a cleft running right across the summit rock uh, in which were found Neolithic votive objects so before the Minoans. But the Minoans built the shrine around it, the wall, and there's an altar, and so on. Scully suggested that cleft peaks may have been the inspiration for the idea of the Minoan symbols of the so-called horns of consecration and the double-bladed axe or labrys. Either that, or they saw the peaks as simulacra of their pre-existing symbols. Okay, we've all shared a few brief minutes, I could give you hundreds of examples, uh, of the kind of dream time perception widely engaged in around the ancient world. But I stress we're talking culturally here, not just individually. It was the way cultures interacted with their landscapes it was part of their spirituality. This form of perception serves to remind us that before we built monuments and places of the worship, it was the land itself that taught us the idea of the holy. Thank you. I just put this blurb up here because uh, if you go to the Taylor and Francis stand at this conference, you'll see reference to our journal, Time and Mind. Thank you.